Uh, since most of you weren't at the papers earlier, let me just say a couple of words about the origin of the conference and then uh, describe what we're going to do. So the conference originated from a Green Group seminar on Shakespeare and the Law that Richard Posner and I have taught along with help from Richard Stryer of the English department for the past two years. And we began thinking the law and literature movement has not done anything new lately and it's uh, in need of a, a boost, and uh, contemporaneously with, with the fact that Richard Posner's Law and Literature is uh, coming out in the third edition, we thought it would be very good to, to coordinate this with, with the conference. Uh, so we were very, very lucky to, to convince uh, Justice Breyer to be our honored guest. And he has selected the three plays that we did scenes from just, just uh, now. That is Hamlet, Measure for Measure, and As You Like It. And so what we're going to do is that he's going to say a few words in the beginning about why he chose those plays and about his uh, the origins of his interest in Shakespeare. Uh, then each of us will take a few minutes just saying something about our own interest in the plays and how we might connect the plays to law in, in the following order, Stryer, Posner, Nussbaum, and Breyer. And then we're going to open it to questions from the floor. So when you have questions, you can go to one of the two microphones over there, and that way everyone will hear you and you'll be recorded and, and all that. So, so welcome, um, welcome, and, and tell us why why did you choose these three plays? I like them. <laughs> uh, I guess I, I'm not an expert on law and literature. I chose uh, as you like it because I love this play. It's about love, and uh, I love Rosalind. And uh, I think sometimes that Rosalind, uh, when I see my daughters and so forth, uh, embodies a, a problem that intelligent women have had forever. Uh, and I happened to see uh, uh, Siegfried, the opera, uh, not too long ago. And there's this wonderful duet between Brunhilde and Siegfried. And there she has this problem. Uh, the problem is, she says, I'm peaceful. I'm happy, leave me alone. But my God, there is passion, <laughs> and I'm going to have to get married. And it used to be particularly difficult, because for an intelligent woman in particular, I mean, what do I do here? He's going to run my life. And oh, but he's so good looking. Oh, oh, oh. And here we have Beatrice, and we have Rosalind. And Rosalind hits on the solution. She'll teach him. <laughs> She'll teach him. And I'm a teacher, so I like that. And what does it remind me of? Groundhog Day? Have you seen Groundhog Day? <laughs> That's it. You'll do it till you get it right. That is the solution for the intelligent woman. All right, now, uh, measure for measure, probably it came into my mind because it seems to be about law but then I'm not certain it's about law. Because when I read it, actually, I read the word measure is not measure for measure, but proportion. And uh, all these people are out of proportion. Uh, it's a mess. Nobody's doing the right thing. I mean, the king, the duke is leaving. The whole city is poor. They're all running off to brothels. Nobody gets married anymore. There's these little illegitimate children running over. Instead of getting married, Isabel goes to a monastery. No, she goes to a convent. And uh, 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 my goodness, he picks somebody who is really uh, 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 just terrible, uh, Angelo, uh, to run this city who can't control himself or anything else. Uh, and can law help here? No, not really. But moderation can, and proportion can. So I thought there could be a discussion about that. And why Hamlet? Well, why Hamlet? That's an absurd question to answer. <laughs> but, but, but I think you do see things differently as you get older, and you reread things. And each time something appears to you differently. And uh, this time, I think what appealed to me suddenly, I thought of, well, this is really uh, about two things. And, of course, I can say it's really about, because you see, it isn't my profession to be involved in Shakespeare. And whereas anyone who is in that field as a profession wouldn't dare say it's really about. But since I'm a total amateur, I can say anything. So I think that what it's about, in large part, or at least it made me think of this, uh, is a certain progression 
the progression from to be or not to be to readiness is all. And then I think of the progression really in Aeschylus, the Arestii, from the law of revenge to we're going to bring justice in. And he tells a story along the way. And what appealed to me as an older person is at the very end, what does he want? He wants Horatio to tell this story. He wants what story? To justify himself? Not necessarily. Maybe to tell the story of what happened to him spiritually throughout this play. And at the end, he says, which I'll leave you, I don't know what this one word means, but I think this one word is important to me now. And he says when Fortinbras comes in, please, please, you tell this story too, for you will repeat it. He says it in much better English. And then he says, silence. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, okay, so we know there is everything in Shakespeare, even law. But those were the reasons that I picked these three stories. Okay, thanks very much. And now we'll each just say uh, something about the themes in those plays that interest us most. So, Richard. Well, I'm happy to say, as a, a supposed professional in this field, that I think the plays are really about things also. <laughs> and uh, I think it's good to think the plays are really about things because I think that Shakespeare was interested in issues. I mean, we have to imagine Shakespeare in composition. Well, what do we know about his means of composition? Every play, with the exception of two, has a narrative or dramatic source. So here's this guy, he's reading and reading and reading and reading, and the sources are all sorts of things. Classical histories, little trashy novels, other plays, etc., etc., etc. He's looking for material. He has to produce two plays a year for a while, and then eventually a little less than one play a year, but he's constantly got to produce these plays, got to produce scripts, dramatic poems to be performed. So, um, so he's reading, reading, reading. One of the reasons that I find the very charming movie Shakespeare in Love rather silly is that they show Shakespeare doing absolutely everything except the one thing we know he did aside from be in plays and uh, uh, write plays is read books. So, um, so we have to imagine Shakespeare's reading. And, what, and he's reading, reading, reading. Presumably he read more books than he used as sources. So, so how does he decide on, I'm going to write a play about, on the basis of a little Italian novel, and it's going to be Othello. Or I'm going to write a play on a familiar story, like King Lear or Hamlet. Or I'm going to redo uh, some stories about English history. Well, I think something he would read, 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 and something caught his attention in the sense of it made him intellectually interested. I think that issues caught his mind. He said, OK. What can I see in the story? Obviously, he's interested in characters, but he's interested in characters within situations. Uh, so this seems to me um, uh, a good way to reach age. And I ask, well, what are the issues that interested him in this story? So that, um, for instance, in, in As You Like It, um, one of the things that helped me in thinking about uh, how the play might be relevant to this kind of occasion was the little scene that we did where the issue of um, violence towards a community that you assume is very alien to your own uh, is not what you expect. And this seemed, seems to be quite an important um, lesson in not assuming that um, the unexpected uh, and uh, unofficial is uncivilized. So part of the part of the interest of a scene like this is that um, this, uh, this guy who bursts in is accused uh, not of, uh, bad, of being a bad person, but of incivility. Here they are in the middle of the forest, and he's accused of incivility. And the key words in this are civility, gentleness. Uh, so it seems to me there's, there's, there's uh, some kind of serious uh, thought there about uh, how uh, social values can appear in places where you might not expect them. And I think this has relevance to colonial situations, all sorts of situations, that I think is not a stretch to see Shakespeare interested in. Um, 
Now, um, something that, um, that I'd want to say about Hamlet, uh, and that again seems relevant to this, uh, this particular gathering, is it seems to me Hamlet is a play very interested in the issue of evidence. Well, on what basis uh, can you know something and on what basis are you prepared to act on something? And it seems to me one of the things that's extremely interesting in the play is um, while we know uh, Hamlet uh, actually gets something right, namely that Claudius did in fact uh, kill Hamlet Sr., he never has any good evidence for this. He's told about it by this thing which claims to be uh, the ghost of his father released from purgatory. Well, England is a dominantly Protestant country that doesn't believe in purgatory, number one. So two-thirds of the audience is going to be absolutely suspicious, going to think this can't be uh, a figure from purgatory. There's no such thing. It's a devil, which of course Horatio says and Hamlet comes to consider. Even if it were, even if you were a Catholic and believed in figures from purgatory, when, first of all, mostly people don't come back from purgatory, they stay there. <laughs> you pray for them. They don't come back. But when they do come back, when the stories where they do come back, there's only one thing they say. They say, pray for me so I can get out of here. Because purgatory got more and more hell-like as the Middle Ages progressed. <laughs> So, they're trying that, that, so if someone's going to come back from purgatory, they're going to say, pray for me, not go kill somebody. <laughs> so he has this, this, so he gets this dubious uh, advice from this dubious thing, which is often referred to as the thing uh, in the first act. And then he says, okay, he gets this bizarre idea, uh, which only somebody who was a humanistically trained scholar would believe, that somehow literature is more powerful than life. So this guy who's perfectly happy to commit a murder, to kill his brother, etc., etc., is somehow or other going to be so moved by a play that he's going to cough up his guilt. It's completely ridiculous. It's the kind of thing. The only context in which it disappears <laughs> is defenses of literature. Uh, so Shakespeare's been reading, or Hamlet's been reading Sidney, and there's a story like this in Sidney. So he thinks, okay, I, I believe this. So now often people think it worked. But um, at a crucial moment in all this, Hamlet makes a disastrous slip of the tongue and describes the murderer in the play within the play as the nephew rather than the brother of the king. And thereby absolutely confuses the experiment because we don't know what Claudius is responding to. He might be responding to Hamlet, his nephew, just saying he's going to kill him. So, um, so the point at which Hamlet thinks he's got conclusive evidence, we, as, um, as people watching the play, know he doesn't, even though we know he's right. Because the next scene is the scene in which Claudius confesses his guilt. But of course, it's in a soliloquy. Nobody hears this but God, us, and, uh, and the speaker. So the whole, the whole question of, of evidence seems to me to be wonderfully uh, rich in Hamlet. Now, measure for measure, it's, it's sort of obviously a play very interested in, uh, in uh, issues about uh, law and regulation and whatnot. But the one, um, the one piece of it that I want to point to, uh, which um, uh, I think was in the scene that we, or was mentioned in the scene that we did. Um, and uh, this is uh, when... Uh, uh, Angelo says to Aeschylus, what knows the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? So this seems to be a perfectly intelligible bit of legal formalism, that it doesn't matter uh, who's in the jury as long as the, as the laws operate properly. What knows the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? It's just a system that has to operate. I think Shakespeare was very troubled by this issue. And um, my, my dear friend, Judge Posner, thinks uh, that the Sermon on the Mount is one of the silliest uh, utterances ever produced, and um, only, uh, relevant, <laughs> only relevant to its immediate apocalyptic context, which is in a way, I think, true. Nonetheless, though, it's, a, it's something that had an enormous effect on Western culture from the time of its peculiar production, 
And somehow this issue of the corrupt judge, even in the face of, a, of an awareness of legal formalism as perfectly intelligible, I think really troubled Shakespeare, and I think was part of the motive for this for this play. So I'll stop there. Uh, actually, the <clears throat> the comment about the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> is from one of my favorite. 19th century English judges, <clears throat> James Fitzjames Stephen, the uncle of uh, Virginia Woolf. And what he said was <clears throat> that the Sermon on the Mount is a pathetic overstatement of duties. <laughs> That's exactly right. Told you. So I want to make two points. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's beautiful nonsense, right? <laughs> It makes sense if you actually think the world is going to end, you know, before your next mortgage payment is due. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't work. So I, th I, I do want to emphasize one point about the law and literature movement, which is that it's a lot more than what we've been doing today and be doing tomorrow. So here we're focusing on works of literature that have law as their theme, maybe incidental theme, but somehow touch on law. But there are, very, there are other really interesting aspects of it. One is the use of literature and, and the techniques of literature uh, and analyses in literary criticism um, that would help um, lawyers and judges to, to, to do better writing, more persuasive. Um, so there have been there are very interesting discussions in modern literary criticism of narrative techniques. And that's something that lawyers and judges can I think really, uh, really, really learn about? And there's actually a very interesting opinion by Justice Souter uh, in a case called Old Chief, in which he actually uses—I don't know whether deliberately or not—but uses um, uh, a narrative theory to uh, reach a, an interesting, I think, correct result uh, having to do with the federal rules of evidence. So in addition, uh, there have been attempts, they're interesting, I don't find them terribly convincing, but I think they're very interesting to use uh, notions of literary interpretation to help in the interpretation of statutes and constitutional provisions. So that's very interesting. And also they, there have been efforts to take works of literature which really aren't about law as such, but which somehow provides a kind of background understanding to problems that uh, 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 lawyers and judges encounter. And uh, a very interesting example of this is a book, uh, probably largely forgot, forgotten by Eric Maria Remarque, called Arch of Triumph, which is about a refugee in France, a German refugee in France on the eve of, of World War II. And I happened to reread it uh, a few <coughs> months ago, and I thought it, it, it illuminated the plight of the paperless refugee in a way relevant to the asylum cases that have become a major um, area of federal jurisdiction, uh, a federal adjudication in our, in our court. Um, but of course, the, the, the largest um, uh, emphasis of the law and literature movement has been on what we've been doing, which is, which is exploring legal themes in um, literary works. Now I have to say that I understand why law is such a common theme in literature. Um, it's a pretty ubiquitous uh, institution in society, ancient as well as modern. And, and also trials are, are very dramatic, so they really lend themselves to uh, presentation in literature. And there are many wonderful works of literature um, that, that have law for their theme and, and you know, covering a wide variety. I'll just mention a couple of modern books. I don't know how many of, of you have read them, but really, really good books about, about um, law. Um, one of them is uh, a novel by Joyce Carol Oates, an early novel of hers called Do With Me What You Will. Another is a novel by William Gaddis called A Frolic of His Own. I mean, these are really terrific books. And many others, you know, Stendhal and Camus and Kafka, and then of course the Greek, the Greek uh, tragedians and so on. But, having, but you know, I don't really think law is the most interesting aspect of any of these works. Um, 
the, obviously the, the authors, the writers, they're using, they're using law you know, as, as a foil or as a you know, background, and they're playing with the law, they're changing the law, making up law, as in a play like uh, The Merchant of Venice. Um, I, I don't think you learn much about, about law. Uh, what I what I thought more interesting about these works of literature about law is that they, they provide um, insights into into jurisprudence. So, like Measure for Measure is dealing with a perennial problem of balance between um, rules, strict rules, and uh, uh, looser notions, standards, concepts of equity that bend. Uh, strict rules, and Angelo, in his speech that you heard uh, a little while ago, he articulates a kind of legal formalism, which is which is quite interesting and actually makes you know when he says I don't have it exactly, but I pity most the, the the persons I don't know when I apply strict rules. What he's saying is there's always a danger that the judge is going to be so moved by the plight of a particular party before him that he'll adopt a rule which actually has bad consequences for more people, but they're the people who aren't before the court, so they're less salient in his thinking. So even though he's a, a wicked guy, Angelo, and of course, the, one of the great things about Shakespeare, he always gives villains really good lines. Right? So you have to think, yeah, you know, the great speech by the ba bastard Edmund, in King Lear, Edmund is a real devil. But what he talks about, you know, bastards aren't we as good as, you know, people born in, a, in the stale bed of a married couple or in a, in a society of arranged marriages for aristocrats. So he makes a lot of great points, but he's still very wicked. <laughs> so in Hamlet, the jurisprudential interest, I'm touching on things that Justice Breyer and Professor Starr were saying. Uh, focuses on um, uh, revenge, which is a stage in the evolution of law and actually remains important. Uh, if you ask why victims of crime uh, will cooperate with the police and prosecutors, even though in most cases they have no financial uh, stake in cooperation, and revenge is a, is, a, is a factor. The support of, of the death penalty is, I think, motivated by uh, uh, a feeling of revenge, which is very deep in people, I, I think really, really genetic. But, um, so in, what in, ha in Hamlet you have a critique of revenge, and I'm using critique in a precise sense. Now, it's not just critical, it's, it's an effort to look at both sides of, of, the, of the problem. Um, I, I, I do disagree very strongly with Professor Stryer, and I'll explain why. Uh, I, think to, I think Hamlet has two incompatible duties. Um, I think he takes the ghost seriously. I think you have to take the ghost seriously. It's really Hamlet's father. It's not a devil. I mean, just look at him, so. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a duty of revenge laid on him by his father. And of course, it's, it's, it's very understandable because you can't invoke any, any laws. Claudius controls the laws of Denmark. So when the legal system is ineffectual, that's when the pressure for revenge is really strong. So he's under a, a heavy duty. On the other hand, of course, uh, you know, the New Testament says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That, now what exactly that means, whether you can have some delegation to uh, uh, human, human beings, that's, that's uh, a big issue. Um, the, the deeper problem with revenge is that, you know, it's a self-help system. The victim, or his family maybe, uh, has the duty of revenge, and yet these people are not necessarily well equipped by temperament or experience or skills to be, to be law enforcers. And you see that in Hamlet. We have three revengers, major revengers. There's a minor one in the, in the recitation by the players before the play. Uh, Pyrrhus, well, forget Pyrrhus. But you have Hamlet, Laertes, and Fortinbras. And they're very nicely uh, compared. So Hamlet is too, um, too hesitant, too cool to be a really effective revenger. Laertes is too hot, too impulsive. So he's no good as revenger either. 
And the, 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 the mean, the golden mean, is Fortinbras, who's perfectly cast to be a revenger. But the problem is, he is perfectly cast because of his extraordinarily um, high notion of honor, which leads him, in, the, I guess, the fourth act, to be willing to sacrifice an army to capture a few acres of worthless ground. So we see problems with revenge. But although I think Hamlet is interesting as a critique of revenge, um, that I don't think is the greatest, the greatest interest of the play, <clears throat> which in my opinion is by far Shakespeare's best play. And since I'm not a professional, I'm not required to admire all of Shakespeare's plays. <laughs> I think actually they, they cover quite a range in quality. But Hamlet, to me, is, is the very best. But what makes it great is not the, is not the revenge motif. It's, it's just a great play about relationships, about personality and character, about the styles of, of being in the world. It's about a profoundly dysfunctional family. Um, and it also has the great theme of maturation. There's a famous uh, essay many years ago by Maynard Mack pointing out that, uh, that Hamlet undergoes a mysterious uh, but decisive change between, uh, uh, between the first three acts before his aborted voyage to England and then the last two acts. So he's impulsive, immature, um, uh, in, in the first three acts, occasionally violent. Um, in the last two acts, he, he seems to, 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 to be a different personality, to be fatalistic in a way, to be accepting, accepting of, of the lack of control that people have over their, over their fates. And it's really um, fantastic. And it's also what I particularly like about, or one of the things I particularly like about um, Hamlet, and this is true in many Shakespeare's plays, it has an almost musical structure. So you have the three, the three great, um, the three revenge plots, and for a playwright to be able to handle the three parallel plots without repetition or tedium and somehow intertwine them um, is, is, is remarkable. And I'll mention just a little parallel, I mean, it's full of parallels and ingenious touches and you know has such dramatic variety. It has the play within a play. It has, it has what seven killings? I think it has. <laughs> it has a ghost. Um, it's got everything. But just so 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 as you saw about um, about an hour ago, I was killed by a moment. and it, that's foreshadowed in a curious way because there's early what seems to be a completely idle remark much earlier in the play about Polonius about how he, he, acted, um, he acted Julius Caesar. Uh, I mean, it's a funny reference to another play by Shakespeare, but he acted Julius Caesar and was stabbed to death in the Capitol. And of course, that's what's going to happen to Polonius. So he foreshadows his death. And that's the kind of ingenious touch that makes it such a charming play. So let me just explain very, very briefly why I do not agree that Shakespeare, I mean, that, that there's any doubt about the, about the authenticity of the ghost. I don't really think an Elizabethan audience would be um, bothered by encountering purgatory because the play is supposed to be about medieval Denmark which be before the Reformation. So whatever strange religious customs they encounter, um, I don't think would, would, would trouble would trouble his audience. Um, but I, I underwent a kind, I experienced a kind of arrested development in terms of literary uh, appreciation as an undergraduate. So I was an undergraduate at Yale, an English major, in the 50s when the new criticism was uh, the dominant style of literary criticism in, well, not everywhere, of course, but certainly at Yale. Yale was the the, uh, the hotbed of, of criticism, and um, of, of new, the new criticism is called. And Cleanth Brooks was a famous uh, new critic, was my senior thesis advisor. And the, the, um, 
The basic premise of the new criticism was that uh, a work of literature should be um, interpreted in such a way as to make it the best aesthetic object that it could be. It didn't matter, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't to be looked at as a source of philosophy, source of ideas, source of ethics, source of history. It wasn't to be judged by any of those external criteria. It was to be judged the way you might judge a, a, work of music, a work of music, an abstract painting, something without uh, a heavy context in uh, a history and ideas and, and so on. And th th there's a famous line by, famous crack by T.S. Eliot about Henry James, that he had a mind too, I'm not sure how exactly, he had a mind too fine to be, that, that it could be violated by an idea. And what he meant was that the, wor the, 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 the task of a, of, a, of a writer, of an artist, is, is not ideas, it's not analysis. Uh, if they use ideas, um, it's a, they're, they're tools to, 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 uh, to, make, to make a work of art. And the accuracy, the histor historicity, the consistency of the ideas, is really secondary, unless it's a strongly didactic work of literature, which I, which I don't regard uh, Shakespeare as, um, as being. And it seems to me that if the, if the ghost is a phony, is a fake, I don't know, it makes the play kind of pointless. It makes Hamlet a terrible dupe. Um, it says, well, look, this, this, this guy Hamlet, uh, he didn't realize this, there's no purgatory. So the ghost has to be fake. And so the, he kills and he dies at the end, all because of some mistake he made. And I think it diminishes uh, uh, the, the play to think of it in those terms. And I, say, I, I use aesthetic rather than historical criteria to, um, to, to value works of literature. Okay, well, as, as a philosopher, I work a lot on the emotions, and uh, I, I, I have been working a lot on the role of emotions, such as anger, fear, compassion, uh, and disgust in the law. So, of course, that's a very uh, good reason to turn to works of literature, because you, you find uh, very complicated and nuanced and, and deep explorations of human emotions and how they work. Uh, and uh, and so that is what I'm going to talk about now. I think there are so many other things that are of interest in, in these plays. But I think Measure for Measure and Hamlet, which were written very close to each other in Shakespeare's career, have a similar focus on sexuality as fearful and disgusting and a danger to good order and political authority. So in Measure for Measure, which was written around the time of a plague in London that actually led to the closing of the theaters for a while in 1603, we see that there's a link between the sex trade and disease and the closing of the sex businesses with the reestablishment of public health and public order. And so successful is the fictional regime depicted in the play in making that link that Claudio, who remember, as, as I wrote in the, in the synopsis uh, before we performed the scenes, has, has actually his great crime is to have intercourse with his own fiance, to whom he would have been married but for some dispute about dowry. Even Claudio uh, has, uh, thinks of their own sexual acts as both dangerous and disgusting. He describes people's sexual desires, including his own, as, quote, rats that raven down their proper bane, a thirsty evil, and when we drink, we die. Now, that's very striking, and it is a very classic image of, of the disgusting, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So the procurer, Lucio, brilliantly played by Guillaume a little while ago, um, is the only one in the play who uses po positive metaphors for sexuality, images of fertility and growth. But of course, he's due to be suppressed, and he's going to lose his livelihood. And his positive attitude to sexuality is certainly part of the disease that this regime is determined to combat. Now, I think the play, I mean, who knows what we can say about Shakespeare's attitude, but, but at any rate, the play lets us see that the disgust with which people view sexuality is 
profoundly irrational. And there's no more risk of catching a disease in the brothel than there is of catching it in the theater. And of course, that comparison would, would have been on people's minds at the time. But uh, un unfortunately, most people in most times and places do not think of risk rationally and, and weigh the costs and benefits. And we know that, that today uh, this is so, and that sex businesses, the, the bathhouses in New York and, and other sex uh, clubs in various places have been closed down with equally flimsy arguments about so-called public health nuisance. And, and if you really were to look at it and ask uh, where, where is the risk and is it really a bigger risk than some, some other dangerous things that people engage in, uh, you know, you, you, you probably would, would, would get a negative answer. But uh, people allow their phobic reactions to sexuality uh, to determine what the law ought to be. And, and uh, so I think that's a very significant issue for law. In Hamlet, it's the sexual relationship between Gertrude and Claudius that's led to apparently murder and the toppling of legitimate political authority. And um, as numerous critics have remarked uh, about the play, we, we don't see much about Gertrude from her own point of view, so to speak. And, and as I thought of playing it as an actress, I, I thought, you know, Gertrude really doesn't know about the murder, and she's probably not, not so bad. She, she really is enjoying her newfound sexuality with this new husband, and she really kind of wants to have some fun in, in, in life, and, and she probably isn't uh, so, such a bad person. But of course, that's not the way Hamlet sees her, and I think what this scene we played is, is about is about uh, Hamlet's view of his mother and his mother's uh, sexuality. His view of life in general throughout the play is suffused with images of disgust at the female body in general, and of course his mother's body in particular. Janet Edelman has written brilliantly about this, and I recommend that chapter of her book to anyone who wants to follow this further. He finds his mother's sexuality something that's filthy, that, for which he uses all these images of sticky, slimy animals and so on. And then he feels himself contaminated by the fact that he's been born of such a body. Remember that he tells Ophelia to go to a nunnery so that she won't be a breeder of sinners. And uh, well, this theme uh, interests me a lot because there has been a long tradition of talking about a, a good, uh, allegedly good role for disgust in law. Uh, Lord Devlin in the 1950s and our own University of Chicago colleague Leo Cass quite recently when he was head of the President's Council for Bioethics have both said that the disgust of an average person is a sufficient reason to make something illegal even if it causes no harm to others. Uh, but by now, there's, there's a large psychological literature, experimental literature on disgust, which really does corroborate what this play uh, suggests, namely that people, people's disgust is, is quite irrational and erratic, and that it often tracks an anxiety that they feel about their own animal nature and their own animal bodies, and, and that sexuality and uh, women's sexuality in particular is very often a focus of that, that anxiety. So. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we are given in the play reasons which the psychology then further corroborates to view disgust with, with great skepticism and to think that the disgust of an average person might actually not be a good reason at all to make uh, something illegal. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, people find various different themes in, in the plays, and there are critics who see Measure for Measure as a play that, that focuses on quite, quite different topics, uh, Christian mercy and so on, and that is certainly a theme in the play. But, but I think the theme of political control over human sexuality is, is a very important uh, theme, at least, in those plays, and, and, and I think we can now... Uh, in, in law articulate uh, in, in our post-Millian age, we can perhaps articulate better than Mill himself did some reasons why we would have not to follow the tradition of, well, Fitz James Stephen really began it, and then Devlin and, and Cass. And if we, if we understand how disgust operates and how it is linked with misogyny and also with, with racism and the subordination of various other groups who are found disgusting, we probably have some good reasons to, to mistrust it as a guide to law. Just a word about As You Like It, I think a very, very different uh, play, as Justice Breyer has very nicely brought out, a play that, that interestingly, you know, where the women are, 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 are free and, and they're not viewed as disgusting by anyone. And, and Edelman remarks on the fact that, that that's only 
It only happens when somehow we're outside the city and women somehow transform themselves into boys. And it's only then that their bodies escape from this uh, the, the gaze of, of, of disgust. But in any case, it's a, it's a very different play. And uh, the characters are forced outside the legal realm and they're forced to improvise. And I think as they do that, we do see them, and, and here I'll get back to Richard Stryer's remarks about civility, discovering some important things about how people should treat each other, about common human vulnerability, and the importance of supporting basic bodily need, which is a major theme in, in King Lear, uh, which we haven't talked about. Uh, certainly, there was much discussion of basic human need in Elizabethan England, surrounding the corn laws and various other proposals to relieve uh, hunger and misery. So the theme of hunger and the need to be gentle and gracious to people who are in need uh, is, is uh, very nicely treated in the play. And, and I would see in this, this thought that, well, we're, we, we all have our experiences of, of loss and unhappiness, and we therefore should use that experience to, to, to be gentle and compassionate to other people. That's a, a kind of proto-Rousseauian reflection, if you will, on, on the role that a kind of um, reflection about our common vulnerability can have in thinking, at least beginning to think, about what laws in the area of, of distribution and redistribution ought, ought to be. So now I'll turn it over to Justice Breyer for anything that he wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, as the ghost, I can assure you, I was authentic. There was a ghost. <laughs> I mean, comment on the, I, I, I pretty much, what do I, one, Dick, I agree with a lot. Particularly, I like what you said very much. That a novel is an aesthetic object, that's why we read it. I mean, we can have all kinds of interesting discussions about them, but uh, basically, that's what I think of it, too. Uh, then you said that, uh, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't have ideas, and it doesn't mean that philosophy is irrelevant. Uh, I like uh, Camus. Uh, and the reason I like, I think Camus is a great novelist, uh, is because he speaks to me about morality. And uh, there he is. He's a moralist. And uh, of course, uh, that's, uh, and maybe Conrad is too. Though Conrad thinks that he is uh, primarily uh, writing aesthetically. Uh, so there, I, I don't separate those. In some books, the ideas and the thought play in, and the morality of it plays in much more. Uh, maybe Jane Austen. I, anyway, you can go down that line endlessly. Uh, what, what do I disagree then? If the ghost is a fake, then Hamlet is a dupe. But I don't think the point was the ghost is a fake. I think the point was Hamlet isn't sure. And I think there's very good reason for his not being sure. And uh, it's then he's not sure. That's why I said once to uh, my uh, nephew, my wife's nephew, who teaches philosophy, I said, I've finally found out who Hamlet really is. And he said, who? I said, Hamlet is a judge. <laughs> and he said, no, no, Hamlet is a philosophy professor. <laughs> and I said, no, I think now he's a law professor. <laughs> Why? Because he's looking for truth. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. He's looking for truth. And by the time he's pretty sure what the truth is, it doesn't really matter that much anymore. Uh, and that's, that now I see he is a judge. And, and uh, there we are. It doesn't matter because he has just the new attitude that, uh, that uh, uh, Dick mentions. Uh, and uh, then the only other thing I could find that I might want to disagree with is the, uh, his uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears theory of revenge. Do you remember that? He said, it's either too hot, too cold, or just right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I buy into Goldilocks uh, or the Three Bears uh, because uh, I, I do think the three theories of revenge are there. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what? Well, Fortinbras, you know, who knows? I mean, Fortinbras isn't there that much, and and it is true that he does. Uh, he he tries to get revenge. Maybe he was going to conquer all of Denmark. We're not certain. I wouldn't give him permission to go over my kingdom. Uh, I'm not sure if he'll stop or not, uh, but, uh, uh, and Laertes is uh, rather pathetic and does, in fact, uh, end however he pardons everybody, he tries, he's sorry. And uh, Hamlet is not after revenge at the end, really, because he's ready. Readiness is everything or all or whatever it is he says. So I basically agree. 
more than I disagree. And I think the others are there as a counterpoint, not exactly. But uh, really, I think the interesting thing is, are, are they speaking to us, uh, is Shakespeare speaking to us as judges? No. Well, no. Well, <laughs> you see, and then Dick pointed out, because he noticed the very thing I noticed exactly in that performance, uh, the very same thing. Uh, which and it was emphasized because the law book was there. We're speaking to the five, three hundred, two hundred and ninety-eight million Americans who aren't in that courtroom. Wow, how often I've used that line. And how often I've justified all kinds of things by it. And how often, and there it is, right there in Measure for Measure. So now he's spoken to me as a judge. But of course, when I read it, I'm not sure he knows what to do about it any more than I do. <laughs> because, in fact, uh, what is it told him? Hmm. Angela is the one who said it, so he must be wrong in relying on it. Yes, he is there. But after all, Claudio didn't do anything wrong. I mean, and moreover, Angelo's pardoned, but he didn't kill anybody. And he didn't even sleep with the wrong person. And indeed, once you pointed out it wasn't even slander, of course they shouldn't kill Lucio. He didn't commit a crime. So the easy cases come out right in measure for measure. But now let's look at the hard case. What do we do with the brothels? Because he's not quite prepared to say, in a world where there are lots of illegitimate children, that brothels should be legalized. But he, isn't, he is prepared to say, let's not overdo this. Ah, that's it. Let's not overdo it. But legalize? I'm not sure. And what happens to Pompey? He gets off, but with a warning, don't come back. And so I say, yes, the sentiment is there. The sentiment of the judge is there, and we don't quite know what to do about that. Don't rely upon the 300 million people not being in this room too heavily but don't give it up either. So I say, thank you, Shakespeare. You have reinforced my instinct as a judge. <laughs> Where am I overall with Shakespeare? I read years ago. Kittredge, I've never gotten beyond this. Kittredge said, and I, I can't quote it, unfortunately. I just have to do it by giving you the idea, which is much worse than what he said. He said it beautifully. Uh, but he said, here is a man who knows every human being every kind of human being, every different kind of character. He knows what they want. He knows how they think. He knows how they behave. And he expresses every one of those characteristic thoughts, methods of behavior, intuitions, and understanding in ways that they themselves couldn't do, though it is them. And he does it all in poetry. Okay, now we have probably about 15 or maybe even 20 minutes for questions. So people who have questions, step up to one of the microphones and address your questions to a, a particular panelist if you can. Can I Otherwise, just say a word about the Duke business? Yes, while people are doing that, you should respond. Um, yeah. Well, uh, first of all, there's no doubt the thing is there. So I'm not, I don't, it's not an illusion, certainly not in the first act. Since Everyone sees it, including a skeptic. Um, the spirit that I have seen may be a devil. So this is Hamlet talking. This is not uh, something that's being laid onto the plate. But, um, but the question is, well, what does it mean if, if, let's say, there is at least this ambiguity, or even maybe a certainty that it's a demon, and, and Hamlet is acting without sufficient evidence, even though he's right? It seems to me this is part of what makes the play a tragedy. I, I agree with Dick that, that you, criticism should make the play the best aesthetic object it can be. On my view, adding this element of uncertainty, perhaps even adding this element of mistakenness, deepens the tragedy and is part of, uh, of what makes it uh, such a deeply, deeply sad and moving play. So anyhow, I, I think that... Uh, this, the view that I'm suggesting, doesn't harm, doesn't necessarily harm the aesthetic appreciation of the play. 
Okay. That's not my conception of tragedy. Gonna, uh, <laughs> my conception of tragedy. We have time for questions. Okay, I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> my conception. This is what the class was like. <laughs> my conception of tragedy is that de it, it deals with uh, insoluble dilemmas, not with some mistake someone makes. Okay, Katrina is waiting at the mic. I think he had an exaggerated sense of the need to, you know, adhere to absolutely strict rules. And, and of course, the fact that, that he turns out to be so, so brittle is his undoing. You know, it's interesting, at the very beginning of the play, he doesn't want to be put in charge when the, when the Duke is taking this little vacation. He, he, he knows he's a number two guy. He doesn't like to make decisions. That's why he retreats behind this, you know, the law made me do it idea. He doesn't want to exercise uh, discretion. He's, he's very brittle. You know, this business of what the Duke does, this is, this is taken right out of Machiavelli's The Prince. That is, if you want to do some dirty, unpopular business, here, you, you want to do something unpopular, you delegate it to, a, um, to an underling. He cleans up. He's very unpopular. Then you kill him. <laughs> One of the uh, papers we heard this afternoon. Um, okay, they, 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 there's several different places where he goes wrong. Um, Constance Jordan's paper earlier this afternoon, I think, showed very successfully that there is a, a lot of talk about how you read laws and an appeal to Aristotle to say you should read them in the light of what, what would the lawgiver say about this case if the lawgiver were present. Now, so one of the things he does is to read the law so strictly that this case of Claudio's falls within it, where if the lawgiver were present, he might have read it uh, to make an exception for that case. Second thing is the severity of the sentence, which is, I think, a separate issue. And Isabella says, look, if he, even if he's guilty, you shouldn't punish it with death. You should be more merciful. And then, of course, stepping one step back, which, which is what I, I, I wanted to do here, I think there is reason to call into question the, the whole idea that there should be laws against fornication. I mean, the play shows that this is inspired by some sort of fear and, and, and bogus arguments about contagion and so on. But, but why on earth should a, a person be punished for, for sleeping with a woman who consents? So, so I think with that level, there's, there's issues uh, too. Oh, I have a question. Does Isabella, do you play it, does Isabella marry the Duke? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, other questions? I hope the participants will join in at this point and other faculty. Because we said everything. Could yeah, I say Ken, something? Kenji wants to say something. Ken, Kenji, Sorry. if you can st step to the mic. Uh, Kenji Yoshino, who's giving a paper tomorrow. This um, is a pretty light question, but it uh, is inspired by what Mr. Fry said about Shakespeare, which is to say Shakespeare described every kind of person, and if we believe that, then he described all the people on the panel, too. So, <laughs> I will answer this on behalf of Dick. It seemed to me he played the right role. Jakes, yes, Jakes is acerbic. He's highly intelligent. He knows a lot of what goes on. He's interested in everything. 
And instead of going back to the town, what's really interesting in him is this man who uh, is living in a cave and has a sudden conversion. And that, by the way, happens to be Dick Posner's next book. It's about cave people. Do you want to answer this for yourself? No. No. (laughs) Well, I think I liked your example at the beginning of of Rosalind, and I've always liked the the, the women in the comedies who managed to... uh, defy the, 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 the rules in, in a successful way. So, uh, yeah, Rosalind has always been, been one that I've enjoyed playing. And I found Gertrude extremely difficult to play because she cr- gives, gives up everything so quickly, and she kind of breaks down in, in su- such a brief time. So then the question I had to ask myself is, why would, why would she do that? No, I think when somebody you really love says these terrible things to you, that's quite different from just hearing them from a... Stranger, so so that's how I tried to, to play it. Uh, but but I do think that the stronger women are, are much more appealing. You know, I think I think Martha's sexy Gertrude was very well performed. <laughs> but but I, I don't see Gertrude that way. I see Gertrude as maternal, and I think what what Hamlet's this is what I think Hamlet's problem is. So Hamlet is at the beginning of the play. He's a young man. He admires his father greatly. His father is, you know, a a kind of guy that a boy admires. What Hamlet is too young to realize is that his father is not a delightful husband, right? He's very stiff, and um, he's always always off fighting, right? Um, On the other hand, we know that uh, that Claudius is uxorious. He really loves Gertrude. And we know he has this, he, he, that he's politic and smooth, and he's very civilian, right? He's not going to go off fighting. Um, so he's kind of more fun as a husband. But um, obviously Hamlet can't understand that, especially since he regards, uh, I think correctly, Claudius as a, as a murderer. Um, so this is what I think gets Hamlet so terribly upset about his mother. His mother is a middle-aged woman. Now, it doesn't matter in terms of, you know, 16th century, whether she's 40 or 50. She's middle-aged from, from that perspective. Hamlet can't understand why this middle-aged woman is, you know, clinging to Claudius and having sex with Claudius. Probably at his age, he thinks middle-aged women don't have sex unless there's something wrong with them. You know, when he says the heyday in the blood is tame, it's humble, it waits upon the judgment. You know, he's saying, what are you doing, you know, sleeping with this toad, as he regards Claudius. So, um, so that, I think, is what horrifies him, have inappropriate sexual activity by your own mother. It's, that's disturbing, and, and, you know, it turns him against women in, in general. I don't think it's the sexual act as such that disgusts him. It's who? It's his mother uh, having a sex with his uncle murderer. Uh, does Richard want to answer the identification question? Well, um, I want to say that I think, I mean, one of the things that immediately came into my mind is uh, uh, Eliot's uh, brilliant early poem, uh, in which we have the lines, No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Um, I think there's a kind of egomania in um, thinking that any of us uh, are uh, likely to be reasonable facsimiles of Hamlet or Rosalind or these astonishing, uh, brilliant creatures. Um, My sense would be um, maybe I could aspire to Horatio. Uh, (laughs) Seems like an honorable... I mean, because after all, I mean, these, one of the things that, that Shakespeare does is give people this astonishing eloquence, uh, and, um, and, and also, in some cases, astonishing uh, other capabilities. So, um, uh, and this is why Stoppard's play is important. I mean, it seems to me the, to sort of find a place for ordinary people, for people who are just ordinarily eloquent and ordinarily intelligent and ordinarily courageous and ordinarily loyal, but are not Kent or Hamlet or Rosalind. Um, seems to me quite a, quite important. And um, so, I mean, again, I, Horatio seems to be a rather high goal. Uh, but it seems to me, at my best, I would maybe hope to be a loyal friend, um, maintain a fairly calm head, 
in a situation which, after all, is not mine, um, and um, perhaps be persuaded uh, not to commit suicide with my friend and tell his story, which, uh, as uh, Justice Breyer said, is so extremely important at the end of that place. So I guess I think the um, just recognizing how um, extraordinary these central characters are um, is important in getting a, a reasonable sense of ourselves and ordinary human life. Okay, there seem to be three people waiting at the mics, and I think that's about all we'll have time for before we adjourn to the reception. So why don't you go next? And say, introduce yourself, please, too. And maybe you can move the mic a little so we can actually see you. Yeah, that, that would be good. Okay. Um, I'm Melody Johnson, and I'm an O'Clock graduate at the law school. Um, hello. Hello. I hello. was. Um, Welcome back. I, it seems to me that part of the disgust also with him and his mother is and seeing his mother is like everyone else. That, um, and and this has to do in a sense with the disgust for class as well, where it seems that the lower classes are closer to the base, or or not, or not as refined and able to control their more animal instincts and to separate themselves from that. So Hamlet is just very disgusted to see his mother being like any other woman. He wants to see her as very particular and fine. Um, and, and I think Shakespeare makes that contrast. And in the scene with Isabella, what's interesting to me is that Shakespeare kind of turns that notion on his head and having a very refined and moved person feel to um, Angelo to see within himself his universal with the criminal. And so I wonder um, what is it that the law is, is meant to do to, to do this justice, to this sympathetic justice? Is it to see the very particular about the individual, or is it to see the individual that is like everyone else? Well, let me just answer about the women that I think, I mean, I think Edelman is right that Hamlet's disgust with his mother is the, the starting point, and it, he, he, he can't get, get away from the idea that there's something quite disgusting about having a, a mother who is sexual, and it's because of that that he then projects all these disgust properties onto Ophelia. He doesn't know anything about Ophelia, and Ophelia, as far as we know, uh, is a perfectly properly behaved uh, person. But he, he says to her, you know, these terrible things about what women are like and what she's like. And I think that's all inspired by, by the view of his mother and, and what he really wants. Uh, I think Edelman is right about this, is to, if he can make his mother pure again, then he himself can be freed from the stain that comes of being born of that. And, and that's what he's trying to do at the end of that scene where he wants her to you know, just refuse and, and, and become a chaste woman again. Uh, so I don't know how that fits with your overall question about where we start, but I guess, you know, in terms of my interest, uh, that I think we, we, the, the way that disgust is often irrational is that it starts from some anxiety that's extremely personal, and then it projects it in this global form onto all people of a certain type in, in a quite irrational way. Wait, that, why do you think, I mean, Ophelia, first of all, he loves Ophelia. Then Ophelia tells everything to her father and her brother who say, stay away from him. So this woman she lo he loves is staying away from him. We don't know quite how long, but it could be weeks. Then the next time he sees her, she says, I'm giving you back all your letters. Then he's perhaps looked up and seeing that Polonius has sent her to trap him. So she's part of this conspiracy too, or at least she's not a safe confidant. And, and the, those circumstances where he wants his uncle to understand that he's going insane, he starts this speech. Now, I don't think that shows that he's disgusted either with Ophelia or with women. He is, if anything, obsessive about the problem of dealing uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the revenge, uh, which he's been told to do. And, and so I, I don't know. I mean, probably you could argue that one both ways, but I didn't take it as uh, inappropriate or showing uh, something wrong with Ophelia. <laughs> I wonder if you could say more, or look at me in the case, it seems like I'm misunderstood, but. 
Um, well, no, I think it's a fair question, but I think that, that, that Shakespeare goes out of his way to make it clear that this thing is not an illusion. I mean, Horatio, my, uh, my current hero, um, uh, is brought in as the skeptic, as someone who says, oh, pish pish, twill tush tush, twill not appear, and is completely skeptical, as many Elizabethans were, about uh, ghosts. Uh, and um, uh, is completely convinced, and these ordinary soldiers see the thing. Uh, so it seems to me just a, just a very different uh, dramatic uh, situation than what we get in Midsummer Night's Dream, where it seems to me Shakespeare is telling us to allegorize. I mean, the joke about bottom turning into an ass is like, uh, gee, that's not much of a transformation. Uh, the guy was an ass to start with. Um, and the flower, the, the magic potion being from a, uh, a poem, a, uh, a plant called love in idleness. Hint, hint, hint. And then you get jokes about people being wood within the wood, I meaning mad with, which they are just telling you how to allegorize. So I think that, that, that um, I think it's a fair question, um, but I think that the plays uh, in cases like this tell you how to read them. And I think that, um, that we've got to be alert to how the play is telling us they want us to read something which is supernatural. Oh, you just made me think who I'd like to be. <laughs> I, I think I would like to be Owen Glendow. And my reason is because he can summon spirits from the vasty deep. Now, I'm often in descent, and maybe that would help. <laughs> Said, you can summon them, but will they come? <laughs> that's his problem. Yeah, that's his problem. <laughs> so, Richard, that's right. I don't think you should settle for Horatio. Uh, I, because you, um, I aspire to Horatio. <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't. And the reason you shouldn't is that Horatio's role is to be the straight man. He's, uh, he's Costello to Hamlet's Abbot. And the reason is, and, and the function of Horatio, he's so straight, he's so dull, you know, loyal retainer type, yes man, is that it really highlights um, Hamlet's extraordinary personality, his, uh, his effervescence, his you know, uncontrolled imagination, his wildness. And it would be less vivid if he didn't have this, this square uh, attending him and uh, trying to you know, keep him a little bit under control. Okay, last question. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Salina Carter. I'm a second year in the uh, History Writer Program. And I want to address, without going too far, the theme that I've um, heard presented by this panel. It's the theme of music. Uh, a couple of months ago, I read in the New Times about the appearance of musical lyrics in one of Roberts' parents. I mean, opinions. Uh, you can't always get the what you want in these cases. And <laughs> more recently, in this panel discussion, Hosmer mentioned, just to the Hosmer mentioned, um, and some of the musical patterns score. And then uh, Justice Breyer's book, he mentions the term musical score. And uh, Akil Mars' book, he mentions the great hits of the law. So I was wondering if you could address any <laughs> themes that might appear, musical themes, where are the themes that might appear within um, your work, including, um, including the Shakespeare and Hamlet? Um, oh, one, one more request. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I realized that uh, the panel's going to be rushed after this event, and Justice Breyer Borges rushed with Bully Act is delivering, and I was wondering if you could sign it. <laughs> thank you. Yes, and, and that, thank you very much for the advertisement. <laughs> Would you like to comment on, that? on the music? Yeah, yeah. I, I learned hand said that. I, I, it's a good, and I use that quite often. He said interpreting statutes is is uh, like a, 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 a player uh, interpreting uh, a performer interpreting a musical score. He said you want to stay true to the statute, and staying true to the statute is something that can't easily be reduced. And here I couldn't agree with him more. It can't easily be reduced to a formula any more than being true to the composer's intent can be reduced to a formula for a good performer. So he made that analogy, and I've thought of it from time to time. The other, which is a more theoretical book, but I found use for that along the theme you cite, 
is uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a French anthropologist who's written a lot about the stories of the uh, South American Indian tribes. And he dedicates his book to music. And because he thinks, and this is true probably of the Romans, I mean the rhetoric school, that the form of the thing matters a lot. And he calls one chapter Rondo, and then then there's a sonata form. And I have thought of that from time to time, and people used to be taught that when they were in law school. And I'm glad I have just a passing familiarity with Cicero's account of rhetoric, which I have when I usually would cheat in Latin class and read the pony, but don't tell anyone. But but, but I mean, those forms, which are are abstract forms, I think matter a lot. Cicero, you know, says start with the introduction and then say your theme and then have an elaboration, just like the sonata. And then uh, the counter-argument and then return to the summation. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it helps. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in the theme of emotional expression in music. And, and I think you know, it's long been a, a puzzle for philosophers who work on it because they think, well, emotions seem to have some sort of cognitive content, but how can music have cognitive content? But, but, but actually, I mean, why should we think that it's only language that can have an intelligent structure? that can have uh, expressive uh, power. So, so that's the issue that interests me, is, is how to think about that issue of the expression of emotion in, in music and how to track that down in particular uh, musical works. Would you want to no. answer that one? No. <laughs> the one thing that occurs to me to say in general about Shakespeare and music is that music is one of the very few things I can think of that seems to be invariably positive in Shakespeare's mm-hmm. plays. I can't think of any negative music, although probably one of my learned colleagues will think of a, of a case that I haven't thought of, but it's, uh, uh, music tends to play a, a very positive symbolic role in the plays. No, I think before we adjourn to the reception, does, does any of the panelists have any last remarks? First of all, the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to get Professor Stryer off the Horatio. Line. So I'm going to quote a great essay by uh, by W. H. Auden, in which he summarizes the ca- the, the uh, characters in Hamlet in a couple of sentences. He says, you know, um, Laertes likes to be a dashing man of the world who visits all houses, but don't you touch my sister. <laughs> Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are yes men, and so on. And Horatio is not too bright, though he has read a lot and can repeat it. (laughs) You want to have a a last word? (laughs) My last word when to come back to our never-ending argument. (laughs) Horatio speaks out in Act 1, Scene 4, tries to stop Hamlet from going to see the thing because he's the one who says that... um, what if it tempts you toward the flood, my lord, or the dreadful summer of the cliff? He's worried that the thing is demonic and is going to tempt Hamlet to suicide. So in that case, he's not a yes man, and he believes the thing might be a demon. <laughs> um, I'll give the last the word to Justice Well, uh, my last word would be to say thank you for inviting me here and for this afternoon. I mean, after we spend time reading these plays of Shakespeare and then spend an afternoon discussing them. We know that, well, will it really help us be better law students or better judges? And we think, well, it just might. It just might. So thank you very much. Thank you.